You've heard the story by now, I'm sure. Some drunk asshole will come up to you at a party and tell you that Los Angeles used to have the best public transportation system in the world. It was great. It went everywhere. Until one day, the evil motor companies and oil companies came and dismantled the whole thing and put, uh, and put highways and buses and shit everywhere. And it'll never be the same again. You've heard that story, I've heard that story a million times. It's not entirely true. It's almost a lie. There's a little bit of truth to it, but it's not what most people think. For a city the size of Los Angeles, it seems almost perverse that it would have such an awful public transit system. Many of us say hard fuck words in traffic when we think about a time when it didn't take an hour to get to the west side from the valley. It hurts us to hear that sometime long, long ago, there was a big transit system that got people where they needed to be without the need for a car. It sounds like some other mythical LA, one with trolleys and people in suits and racism and sexism right out in the open, right where you can smell it. It's true, Los Angeles did have the red car. A big elaborate system of streetcars that ran everywhere, all over the city, even into Orange County. It went out in the San Gabriel Valley, out in the San Fernando Valley, and all the way out to Venice. It went out in the urban areas and out to the sticks. 1,150 miles a track, 900 cars. 25% more mileage than New York City subways cover today. The myth about GM destroying the streetcars goes way back to 1974, when a government attorney named Bradford Snell testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Snell claimed that GM was in on a plot to dismantle the streetcars in order to build more freeways and buses. There was a company called National City Lines, and GM was in bed with them. But GM was pretty slutty in its day, so that's no surprise. National City Lines bought the yellow car, which was a smaller, intercity operation. But keep in mind, they did this well after the decay had happened. They never owned or used the red car, but National City Lines did take control of some of the public transit in LA. But it was nothing along the lines of what the red car was up to, which was a much larger operation. And there was a conspiracy charge of National City Lines buying out the yellow car and replacing them with GM buses. Okay, so there it is. That's it. That's the conspiracy. The rest is a bit more complex. Public transit in Los Angeles had always been a ploy, a gimmick. The rails and streetcars that clanked all around were put there by real estate investors. These guys put these things out here to increase the value of their neighborhoods, but they didn't do it to be of service to them. Most cities had built rail in order to make the city churn, to get people where they needed to be. But Los Angeles is the Wild West, we have always had a culture of doing things different out here, and sometimes not always for the best. So real estate investors built their own rickety rail lines, which were all in turn bought up and merged, and that's how we got the Pacific Electric Railway, also known as the Red Car. Way back in 1894, a couple of investors called Moses Sherman and Eli Clark bought a few old horse car and cable car systems and formed the Los Angeles Consolidated Electric Railway, which had lines running through Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and Santa Monica. Collis and Sherman sold the thing off in 1898 to a couple of investors, Collis Huntington and his nephew Henry Huntington. The story of the red car in Los Angeles a lot of it is the story of Henry Huntington and Harry Chandler, and we'll talk more about him later. Henry Huntington started buying up a lot of land and more railways, which he merged all together. The whole thing was going to lose money from the start. Huntington knew this, but he had to get people out to the land he was selling, and he had a lot of it. He owned more than a quarter of the land in places like San Gabriel, South Pasadena, San Marino, Redondo Beach, Huntington Beach, the list goes on. In 1911, 
Henry Huntington sold off Pacific Electric to Southern Pacific Railroad. He had developed the land and didn't need the red car anymore. This is what's called the Great Merger of 1911. Southern Pacific was a big deal then, so this merger essentially makes a fat cat a morbidly obese cat. Though they didn't get all of it, there was the Los Angeles Railway, the yellow car. Henry Huntington actually kept the yellow car. I like to imagine him alone and hated, playing with the yellow car like some kind of big, old, weird kid, all alone with nothing but his zillions in the thousands of lonely nightmare hours with his trains and crying himself to sleep. No wonder why the yellow car fell into Conspiracyville. The standards fell to unacceptable levels in the 1920s, and this eventually led to the red car's demise. But why did the standards fall anyway? What happened? Well, Harry Chandler happened. I can't really pin the demise of the red car on any one individual, but if I had to, I would pin it on Harry Chandler the publisher of the LA Times from 1917 until around his death in 1944. Chandler had his hands in everything. Union Oil, freeway construction companies, Goodyear, all kinds of LA real estate. He transformed LA. He owned a ton of the San Fernando Valley and was responsible for much of its development. The Hollywood sign itself was originally built as an advertisement for a property syndicate Chandler was partnered with. Here on Chandler Boulevard, which is actually named after Harry Chandler, you can actually see where the old red car used to go. The north side here was its own paved road. It was called the Automobile Speedway, and it had a speed limit of 100 miles per hour because everybody's crazy back in the old days. The south side here was a dirt road. It was for horses and farm equipment, and the red car ran right down the center here. And it was lined with these big cedars that grew really fast. They were planted there to block out the view of wheat fields. Chandler headed out for the red car. He made the LA Times an anti-red car publication. He dubbed them Slums on Wheels. The bad PR was rough on the red car. With financing and new roads, more people were buying cars and driving. Because of all the bad publicity the LA Times had given the red car, people refused to vote new taxes in for its upkeep, and soon it fell into disrepair, and there were more problems. Its presence got to be a pain in the ass. Anytime there were street crossings present, which was pretty much everywhere in the city, the speed of the streetcar was greatly reduced. Sometimes the tracks would just be paved right over with asphalt. In order to combat the issue of congested streets, they did open a subway up, which started here at the subway terminal building, and went over to Westlake. It only lasted for 30 years, closing down in 1955. Inevitably, the buses started coming in after all of this. Even back in 1915, LA County had 55,217 cars for 750,000 citizens, the highest car to person ratio in the country at the time. The thing about all these people with cars was that it was making them able to settle way farther out in the sticks, places where there was just no hope of rail coming out to. And so the real sprawl began. As we started to progress into the century, freeways were being built on a massive scale, and a ton of money was being sunk into them. Ridership on rail fell steadily into decline. A ton of red car lines had been cut in the 40s. Almost all of them were cut in the 50s. And then finally, after decades of decay, the last red car rode in 1961 from Los Angeles to Long Beach. Freeways were seen as progress. The WPA and state government funded the first freeways. Gasoline tax funding came a little later, post-1947. And then finally, oh, the freeways came. The first ones in Los Angeles were the Hollywood, the Arroyo Seco, the Harbor, and the San Bernardino. And they gave way to a whole new kind of horror. A whole new kind of terror. A terror that is all around you.